I'm Dave Gustin. I'm the director of the School for the Future of Innovation Society. I'm going to move this mic to this side so I can speak to the mic and look at more of you than if it's over there. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here this year in front of you, not with my foot in a boot. For those of you who were here last year, I was doing this uh, with a broken foot and was, uh, I guess, seated through most of this. But this is the first enlightening lunch of the 2019 2020 academic year and therefore the state of the school address that I have taken uh, to delivering and I think it's become a sort of important function because of some things that you hear about as I describe the school um, but the school is still very new the school is still uh, I think thankfully very diverse and somehow you know at the beginning of the year and maybe we can find some other uh, ways of uh, and times during the year of stitching it together a little bit and giving you an overview of what's going on, what the progress of the school and the faculty, staff and students has been recently and uh, what things look like going into the near term future at least. So I want to start um, a little autobiographically. I did not grow up in the Lackawanna Valley, uh, but I grew up in northern New Jersey and not that part of northern New Jersey that most people see when they fly into Newark Airport, uh, the part that one of my senior colleagues calls Mordor. Okay, this is a part that I grew up in uh, where actually the house where I grew up and my parents still live um, abuts a 1200 acre wooded county park. And from the hill in that park, you could see the Manhattan skyline. And I didn't quite, you know, sort of fully grasp the importance of that place, um, both in, in my mind and in the way it uh, influenced the way my thinking, my career uh, evolved until I got to graduate school when I took a course by the wonderful historian and cultural critic Leo Marx. And Leo wrote this fabulous book called The Machine in the Garden. And The Machine in the Garden is essentially about 19th century America and about the transition that it made from the pastoral society uh, that entered the 19th century to the industrial society that exited uh, the 19th century, and how a good portion of the 19th century was, was basically trying to sort out uh, culturally, socially, technologically, how it was that these two different things, the sort of uh, the industrial, the technological, and the pastoral and the agricultural fit together. And through works of art like the Lackawanna Valley by George Innes, um, Leo sort of imagined that there was a fictional place where the ideals of harmony among technology, society, and nature came together, and he called this place the middle landscape. And for him, it was a fiction because you can see in this picture the sort of technology is um, imagined by that steam locomotive that you see in the central uh, part of the picture by a couple of smokestacks uh, out in the distance, the beginnings of industrialization, and yet you've got this wonderful uh, field of grain. You see the harvest that's been uh, gathered together uh, in the foreground, and uh, this person in a straw hat and a red shirt is observing the scene, and it appears perf perfectly in harmony. And yet you know that if you were that person sitting in that landscape, uh, you would hear that locomotive, you would begin to smell the soot from the smokestack, and at least in uh, contemporary vision, you might begin to wonder about whether you would want to eat the grain that was harvested in that field if the train was passing so closely by and dumping its coal ash uh, on the field. And so that's the sort of fictive nature of the middle landscape that we don't often, um, we're not often able to put the technological and the pastoral together in ways uh, that they might set. And yet there I was uh, growing up in northern New Jersey with these 1,200 wood wooded acres in my backyard and looking out over the greatest city on the planet. And so in a way I grew up in one of the closest realizations that I could imagine to this imaginary landscape. Um, and what that has done uh, for me is that that has helped me think a lot about some of the themes that are evident in the School for the Future of Innovation Society. First, in particular, the idea of technology in society, that we have these things that we often think of as separate. We have the technology over there, we have the locomotive over there, and we have society and nature in some place uh, separate. 
and that they belong in their separate domains and that there are all sorts of conflicts when they come into, when they come into contact. And I think that uh, idea is based on a, on a fallacy. And if you're part of the school, you begin, you know, you may have studied this, you may be just being introduced to it, but that the separateness of technology and society are exactly what we are trying to work against. That um, once we see the, technolo the technological and the social as um, different sides of the same coin, as things that are integrated in every manifestation that exists, that the train you know, that locomotive and that field are both examples of things that we do technically and socially, um, that you can begin to grasp the, uh, the ways that we might take that middle landscape from a complete fiction to something uh, that is uh, at least more real, some place where we can begin to craft some harmonies between the technological, the social, and the, and the natural. So it's that concept of technology and society, the idea that when we're looking at a technology, we're also seeing something social. When we're looking at social organizations and social behaviors, we're also looking at something technological that I think is really part of the core idea of what the school is about. Once we make that realization about the proximity, the integration, the overlappingness, whatever you want to call it, of the technological and the social, then the next step uh, that you see here, the future is for everyone, becomes a little bit more clear in the sense that, well, when we engage in the process of future making, when we think about doing things that are anything other than looking backward or acting in the present, there's a whole scope of future making that we have, and we don't want to let that get delegated to certain narrow segments of society that might only, for example, focus on the technical sides and forget about the social sides. And in modernity, that's roughly what we've done, that we've delegated a whole host of the future making activities to people with scientific technical engineering training and not incorporated uh, those social elements as best as we could um, into those processes of future making. And so here, the future is for everyone is not so much a descriptive statement as a normative imperative, okay? It is about our activities at the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, helping create, bring into being a future that is, that will be for everyone, because up to the present, it really hasn't been. I want to elaborate those ideas just very briefly in three kinds of projects. And when I give sort of um, smaller, more uh, local versions of this talk, I actually bring uh, the props with me, but since I'm standing in front of you uh, behind a podium, which the communication consultant told me I should never do, they want me out there. Um, um, I often bring props with me, and that's sort of why this array of three activities is here. But the first thing I want to tell you about is Scribblebot. Um, so Scribblebot, as you can uh, more or less see in this photo, is a segment of swimming pool noodle. And you can decorate it any way that you want to decorate it. And um, you put magic markers as legs for Scribblebot and you put an electric toothbrush down the middle of that swimming pool noodle, you turn the electric toothbrush on, and Scribblebot dances and draws on a piece of paper for you. And what is uh, cool about Scribblebot is you can have conversations with kids, and the, the Center for uh, Innovation and Formal STEM Learning has done this, validated with kids as young as eight years old. Um, is Scribblebot alive? Why or why not? Is what Scribblebot is drawing a, um, art? Why or why not? Uh, if Scribblebot were to create a, um, a work on a piece of paper and somebody wanted to buy it, um, would they pay you or would they pay Scribblebot? Um, if Scribblebot were to turn itself on and destroy some important document, who would be responsible for that destruction, you or Scribblebot? And these are fabulous questions to begin to uh, investigate with kids who are eight years old, and this is sort of, this is where the, um, the expansion of the conversation of who gets to partake in future making happens with Scribblebot. Um, but what's really happening also is that, you know, out in the big bad world, the eight-year-olds aren't there yet, but a lot of us are, you know, entering it, figuring out whether we're going to enter it or not. Uh, private corporations are having conversations internally and externally about how is it that they gain intellectual property protection for things that have been created by artificial intelligences? Okay, who gets the money when Scribblebot draws something? You or Scribblebot? Same question, frame for eight-year-olds. Second thing I want to talk about very briefly is Solar Spell. Um, so this is a technology, there are various origin stories, and where's Laura in the audience? 
Um, there she is, she's hiding already. Um, I, I tell one version of the origin story, Laura of course tells a different version of the origin story. Um, but one of the ways that um, Solar Spell embodies this sort of technology and society idea is that there had been circulating in the world um, a whole mess of ideas and a whole lot of objects that tried to get the content of the World Wide Web and, um, and you know, various places in the web in front of children in under-resourced areas who might not have had access to that material otherwise. And some of those objects manifested themselves as, you know, really cheap laptops that could connect to the, the web, and you've heard of the one, lap, one laptop per child, $100 laptop projects, things like that, where a lot of those pieces of hardware ended up not serving uh, the function that they served. When, um, Solar Spell was designed. Part of what went into this design of a small, solar powered, ruggedized web emulating system, Solar Spell does not connect to the web, but it connects to a device through a local area network, was the social insights about how such devices might better work in the areas in which they were introduced. So, Solar Spell provides a route outside of um, an electrical grid, outside of the internet. Um, but it embraces the capacities of teachers and a learning environment that has to be actively engaged with the students in order for it to actually work as uh, a teaching tool. Um, and over the past several years, uh, Laura and uh, her, um, uh, her colleagues who have designed and built Solar Spell, the students who she works with in the service learning model have taken at this point now hundreds of Solar Spells um, into a variety of places around the world. They've partnered with the Peace Corps and Solar Spell stands as a different kind of example to how is it that we can get educational resources to people in under-resourced environments apart from you know, now we have the, you know, the beginnings of the satellites that are meant to cover the sky and beam internet down at everybody. This is a different kind of model that is perhaps more sensitive to those dense technology and society relationships. Um, third thing that I want to mention is American Dream Tara. This is an older, oh my god, we're clustered on here. This is one of uh, Lauren Keeler's projects. I didn't know they were going to sit at the same table. Um, but uh, it came out of, um, work that Lauren Keeler was doing with Michael Bennett and with uh, Brian David Johnson, um, both of whom are on the faculty here as well. And it was an idea to be able to engage just about anyone in informal settings in discussions about what for many people is a very provocative, very elusive, and yet still very powerful idea of the American dream. And so what they did was they designed a very simple uh, sort of tarot-like uh, game where there's a deck of cards and as a player you will turn over three of these cards and you'll be introduced to concepts that might be related to the American dream. Those concepts could range from, uh, you know, from personal and, and familial ones to economic ones to technological ones. And the ask of you as a player is to begin to construct a narrative that involves the three cards that you've turned over. Okay, all well and good, you've now begun to tell a story influenced by your own values and the cards that have shown up at the table about what you think the future of the American dream might be. Then sort of the twist to this is um, you're doing this in a public space, uh, perhaps uh, as, an, uh, as an adjacent activity to a large event that's going on, and somebody's standing next to you, and the dealer will say, okay, the second person, turn over another card and integrate that into the narrative that the first person has told. And all of a sudden you've created conversations between people who otherwise might never have conversed about something that is incredibly important and provocative in the relationship between technology and society in the United States. So those, those are three examples from current faculty in the school about the kinds of things at this technology and society nexus, each of which expands the domain of who gets to play in thinking and creating the future. So that's the sort of introductory piece, um, something of a set piece that I have. What I want to go to now is a set of sort of top level headlines about the news in the school and a couple of details about where those headlines come from. And then hopefully uh, I'll be able to move this quickly enough so we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. So top level headline, um, the school is sort of booming in terms of growth of faculty and the staff. 
And this year we have six new faculty members in a variety of capacities joining us. Um, uh, one of them, Diana Aiton Schenker, is hired as a professor of practice shared between SFIS and the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. And her remit in this position is to basically um, forge an identity for the art science nexus here at ASU. And she is also hired to be the executive director of the art science journal Leonardo, because Leonardo is now joining the sort of suite of ASU's knowledge enterprises, along with uh, Future Tense and Zocalo and Issues in Science and Technology. And this is a new relationship that we hope will give great profile to a lot of the wonderful art science work, uh, including uh, Emerge, that happens at uh, ASU. Also with Haida and Arts, Media, and Engineering, we have uh, pivoted, or Ed Finn has pivoted his faculty position, and so he will now have his tenure home here with SFIS and the rest of his line uh, remaining in Haida, Arts, Media, and Engineering. And this is fabulous, I think, because really, with Ed's Center for Science and the Imagination, his intellectual home really belongs squarely within the work that the school does. Um, you won't see him this semester because he's on sabbatical, but he's with us. Uh, anyway, um, I mentioned uh, Lauren Withlicum Keeler. She had been with us in various capacities before. Now she's in a, uh, a tenure track position. And her work, uh, as you've seen with American Dream, focuses a lot on futures, um, sh but in various kinds of uh, public engagements. Um, one of her specialties is engaging with uh, state and local decision makers. And she just showed me this morning the printout of Tempius. Sustainability Action Plan, Climate Action Plan, uh, for which she is the lead author. And that work, I think, really exemplifies the engaged work that a lot of our faculty do and is really a wonderful way to bring the ideas that we generate out into the community. Um, also hired in this sort of futures and community search that we did last year as an assistant professor, Marta Burbis Blasquez and Marta's here someplace right in front of me. Um, and Marta also, again, works in this sort of futures and community register. Um, more of her work is at the grassroots, um, in addition to elites, and working on questions of resilience uh, and sustainability as well. Um, we also have hired as a lecturer, Matt Fagan, um, and Matt will be spending, thanks Matt, Matt will be spending uh, some time teaching uh, both in the um, uh, HSD colloquium uh, this first semester and developing some other face-to-face -face and online courses with us. And Associate Research Professor Jeremy Babandur. Is Jeremy here? Um, no. So Jeremy is the uh, director of the Arizona SciTech Festival. He's been active with ASU from the very beginnings of the SciTech Festival and will be, um, you know, both through that and, and other activities, helping us um, develop more uh, in-depth engagement opportunities with the uh, science and innovation ecology across the state. So those six folks are um, now added to the relatively large number that we already had. So we have 55 faculty members in the school of all different types, the tenured and tenure track, research, teaching, professors of practice. And I just want to subdivide those in a couple ways to enlighten you as to sort of where the efforts of all those 55 faculty members go and what they look like. So um, first thing is that not all those faculty members are full-time or full-time for us. We share with other units around ASU approximately a third of our faculty members. And so those 55 bodies become uh, just over 41 full-time equivalents. And those shared relationships bring tremendous benefits, I think, to both partners. We call them shared rather than joint or split or something else um, because of that, that mutual benefit that we see. And so for some of these folks, like the uh, six faculty members that we share with Fulton Schools of Engineering, uh, the idea is to have those faculty members be conduits for a lot of the ideas about technology in society and about broadening the base of future making into the schools of engineering. And this was actually one of the, the mandates that came from President Crow in the very first meeting that the school was discussed. Um, for other shared faculty members in arts and sciences and law um, and elsewhere, it really is about the opportunity to take advantage of the mutual perspectives of those areas. Um, 31 of those faculty members uh, are on tenure tenure track, and of those 24 and a half 
full-time equivalents. So we're sharing not just uh, you know research faculty, but our tenure track faculty uh, as well. And yes, um, you will note that folks who are involved in personnel evaluations, you folks who are involved in being shared bodies between different entities, there are transaction costs to bear here. Um, you get evaluated in two different units. Um, we have to coordinate with those other units that we're evaluating you with. Um, but those transaction costs are really worth it because the collaborative endeavors that are built out of this relationship, are, they're just profoundly important um, for SFIS, which has identified itself really within the university in its first four years as a place of collaboration, as a meeting space for multiple kinds of disciplines. Um, and there's the, the update of the number about those different kinds of disciplines. So the faculty around the school, those 55 bodies, represent now 43 different doctoral disciplines. Um, and these, and as well as five different non-doctoral preparations. And so the School for the Future of Innovation Society is um, something like the beating heart of inter or trans or multi or post-disciplinarity uh, at ASU. This is not the interdisciplinarity in units that have chemistry, biochemistry, and biology next to each other. This is the interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity of geography, of physics, of sociology, of food studies, of law, um, and of political science. Okay, and what this allows us to do ideally, and there are probably some good examples of it in practice already, but what it allows us to do ideally and aspirationally um, is to be able to bring these different disciplinary perspectives to bear on sets of problems um, among the research centers that we have in the school, and there are now 10 or 11 core research centers, to be able to address challenges in the world from different disciplinary perspectives, because of course the world is not organized by academic discipline. Um, and then to be able to face those collaborative challenges outside of the school in ways that we're comfortable in facing because on the one hand we might have a physicist or an engineer or a sociologist or a political scientist who can talk to those disciplines but also because that physicist, that engineer, that political scientist or sociologist is now capable within the school of talking to that diversity of folks, representing that diversity to the outside as well. Um, and so this is, I think, again, particularly at a place like ASU, which puts a premium on um, working in the community, on uh, facing real-world challenges. This interdisciplinarity is a real benefit. Again, it comes with its transaction costs and, and other challenges. It makes evaluation a little bit harder. Um, it makes understanding the norms that faculty, um, particularly younger, newer faculty come from a little bit um, more challenging to work with and embrace within the school, but I think the school has really a, a good, strong uh, culture of uh, interdisciplinarity, of the centrality of these things, like technology and society, um, and like an orientation toward the future that helps overcome those challenges. Um, staff in the school have uh, grown tremendously as well. And so now we're, we have uh, 35 staff members in the school, nine of whom uh, are new in the past academic year. And uh, we're currently searching on three open lines in the business office, Stella O'Hanlon um, and Jessica Bonzo. Um, in the DC office, Kara Hapke and Leah Kaplan. Project staff, uh, Dean Frias and Sarah Jordan. Dean's working on informal science ed and Sarah's working um, with uh, Laura on Solar Spell. Um, and in uh, communication engagement, Maddie Nelson and Jenny Strickland. Um, and then the assistant to the director, where's Michelle? Michelle. Um, Michelle told me not to, that I shouldn't point out that she's wearing her Quest t-shirt. Um, Michelle was with us for a while before we were the school, then she went off to work with Quest, which apparently provided her with more clothing than we did. Um, and now she is my assistant and basically is, you know, um, responsible for many, uh, if not all, of the successes that the director's office has and responsible for none of the failures. So thank you, Michelle, in particular. Um, other areas of growth in the enterprise. So the piece of perhaps sort of most, um, you know, spectacular, high-end, numerically uh, quantified um, success is in the research enterprise. Um, but I do want to point out before I go to the numbers that it's not just all about the numbers, um, although we have been given a number and I'll talk about that, um, but it's also about participation and it's also about impact. So on the numbers side, 
and you can see, I hope that's legible to the back, um, proposals, awards, expenditures, and return on indirect cost over the past uh, four years of the school, including the most recent fiscal year, uh, 2019, and then that uh, these are in millions of dollars, and that uh, gold expenditures over in 2025 is the goal of $20 million that's been set for us by the central administration. And what you can basically see here in staying in that expenditures line is that we're just about halfway there, and that just about halfway there represents two doublings in the past four years, um, which is an incredible achievement, um, worthy of applause, uh, but, um, and really, uh, Ira has set up, Ira Bennett has set up as Associate Director for Research, um, a great research team and uh, he, and particularly Jenny Crayer, but also the, the uh, pre-award and post-award folks that are in that group have been doing a spectacular job, both in terms of the sort of higher end management and strategy of this enterprise, and also in terms of bringing as many of the faculty into the research enterprise as are interested and willing to be part of it. Okay, so, you know, we are a research university. We want our faculty to be engaged in research. Um, Ira says that when, you know, faculty ask him when we talk about dollar amounts, what's, you know, how much research should I be doing? Ira gives exactly the right answer, that amount of research which advances the goals that you have. Now, as a school, we do, in fact, have a measurable goal. Um, and like I said, we're about, uh, we're very nearly uh, halfway there and still have uh, a long way to go in terms of growth of the faculty, in terms of growth of the capacity of individual faculty members to contribute here. Um, but the growth of the research enterprise has really been tremendous over the past several years. Now, what else are we looking at in terms of the research enterprise? So you'll see again those dollar amounts in that central column and in the uh, left-hand column in the gold, we're looking at the number of, in proposals, the number of proposals and the number of investigators involved, the number of awards and the number of investigators involved, the numbers of um, grants that are currently expending funds and the numbers of investigators involved. So if you look at that, um, that bottom number, the expenditures, for example, we have 75 active awards and 41 active faculty in awards that are generating expenditures. Four-fifths of our faculty, of all our faculty, are involved in the research enterprise in some way that's generating expenditures. That's a fabulous number that is more intensive than you'll find in just about any other unit except units that really make people pay for their salaries and, and their space and so on. And it's something that I think we're, uh, we're rightly proud of. Um, and you can also see sort of where those numbers get generated. In the past fiscal year, 38 members of our faculty, and we just added six. So, you know, that, uh, the denominator there would actually be closer to, uh, to 50. So 38 of 50 faculty in the past fiscal year have uh, participated in putting in proposals. The other thing to note from this, you can't judge it directly because, um, you know, fiscal year uh, 19 proposals are not the same uh, proposals as fiscal year 19 awards, but the real experience represented there um, we have a tremendous success rate that the expected value of any particular proposal that we submit based on that success rate is very high. Um, that was achieved in a variety of ways, Iris team working very intensely with folks on both large and small science proposals, but it represents a real quality of the research that is done, a real quality of the faculty uh, in the school, and that is not lost on the central administration. This is something that the president, the provost, the vice president for research, uh, they know these numbers. And so, you know, for the folks who are involved in the research enterprise, uh, this is really fabulous work and congratulations and keep at it. What I wanna do just very quickly is highlight three different kinds of contributions to the research enterprise that we have. And um, first, sort of at the, you know, at the, highest, largest level that we are currently capable uh, of doing work. Paul Martin and Ray Ostman and the Center for Innovation in Informal STEM Learning, um, they operate at the top of their field nationally and globally. They are regularly and successfully competing for what the university has occasionally called the three M awards, the multi-million, multi-year, multi-institutional awards. Um, uh, chief among this is an award 
uh, from NASA that is, well, we can't talk about the future yet on that, um, but the, the first iteration of that award, Paul, was 12 million, 14 million? 16 and a half was the first iteration uh, of that award, and we'll be talking about the future around that uh, shortly. So this is the stuff that, at the level of the most senior faculty members who are active in these 3M awards, really drives things, drives impact, drives numbers of, of engagement um, through their prior experience with what used to be called the Nanoscale Informal Science Education Network, now the National Informal STEM Education Network, NISNET, um, work that gets done by Paul and Ray and some of their other colleagues who are doing work at this scale, work that they do reaches 10, 15 million pairs of eyes in 600, 700 science museums, science centers across the country. So that's the kind of impact that research at this highest uh, scale can have. Another model of success, um, and here's a picture of Cynthia Salinas. Cynthia here, she missed her call out. Um, so uh, Cynthia is a tenured associate professor, and over the past year, she has significant shares of two awards, the origins of which are in the more science and engineering enterprise, but she is the uh, lead PI on the social science version of these. One is with uh, an NSF award on uh, research and training uh, around smart cities that I think Ponch is the lead PI on, another forthcoming that we expect from the National Institutes of Health around public engagement and futuring around um, uh, human genetic engineering in the age of CRISPR. And so Cynthia, in part through the Center for Study of Futures that she leads is uh, continuing and building on the legacy of the Center for Nanotechnology and Society, or at least part of that legacy, in partnering with science and engineering enterprises around ASU and bringing a active social science research component, in this case mostly futuring, to those activities. And that part, that kind of, of research, um, now constitutes something between a third and a half of the school's uh, research portfolio. Um, a third way that um, research gets built, Jesse is here someplace, I saw him. Jesse, um, and uh, Jesse's the guy behind the turtle. Um, Jesse is an early career scholar. He joined us last year as an assistant research professor, had been a postdoc, um, and Jesse has done an enormous amount of work initially at the smallest scale of research support in the $25,000 and $50,000 level, um, running around, being in front of foundations that uh, provide philanthropic support uh, for research, being out in the field, doing the research, and building the network at the very beginnings of his work that then are going to support what looks to be a really promising uh, uh, research direction and already at this stage in his career he has one of those awards where he's bringing uh, a substantial part of his uh, his work to uh, as a co-PI to that larger domain that uh, is working on uh, his, his particular uh, focus bringing new technologies in particular uh, a solar powered um, light that attaches to fishing nets that excludes turtles that excludes sharks um, and also, by the way, benefits the way that the local fisher folk get to um, participate in, um, in an extractive economy that allows them to survive and allows them to potentially market the, uh, uh, the fish that they catch as sustainable and, and you know, fit for enlightened consumption. Um, so Jesse, at the very beginning of his career, has really done the, the hard work of, um, of finding the right niches in this funding ecology and stitching them together. And that work has been done very much in conjunction with our research advancement staff, um, but it is another kind of model for an early career scholar to really contribute and have, by the way, an impact on the Fisher folk with whom he collaborates. So second kind of uh, top level headline, great student achievements and outcomes, but at the moment um, only slow growing academic programs. Um, and this is particularly the case in the undergraduate and, and master's curriculum um, where we need to be able to reach more students uh, at ASU, both bringing them into ASU and reaching across the university. So perhaps needless to say, one of the places where we've had this fantastic set of outcomes among the students that have been working with us is in the research domain. And so 
Um, we have created, under the guidance of Emma Frow, uh, the SFIS Undergraduate Research Fellowship, SURF. It's meant to be the sort of catch the wave SURF, not the, you know, you are working under my thumb SURF, although um, it could be interpreted as that. Um, and we provide the undergraduate research opportunities both for credit and uh, for stipend. And we have grown from a very modest program in the first year, uh, three years ago, to a much more robust program now where we have 14 faculty around the school involved. So about a third of our faculty are involved in uh, guiding undergraduate um, research fellows. And the really interesting part of this is that uh, of the number of students that we have in the school, nine of them are involved in this. That's not a huge share of our not huge number of students, but we've got uh, 50 students from outside SFIS right now um, participating in the, uh, I'll go to that in a second, um, participating in the program. And this is not something that is normal among other units. Other units really restrict their undergraduate research programs to who it is that they serve in their majors. Um, but again, this is, I think, part of what our mission is to provide some connectedness around campus to bring interdisciplinary and technology and society training to uh, a variety of, of students across campus. The numbers of students that apply from outside uh, SFIS are very large to this. We have to uh, sort them significantly. Um, one of the particular successes this past year uh, was Emma's own research with her students about um, unregulated uh, stem cell clinics in uh, the Southwest and research that uh, she guided her students through doing, whereas uh, published recently in stem cell reports and garnered a whole lot of uh, uh, interesting and appropriate uh, attention based on this undergraduate research. There are other uh, very strong undergraduate research programs that faculty uh, have built. There was some um, important work that is Katina here. I know that Katina has a very large group of undergraduates that she's working with, many from uh, engineering where she has a shared appointment um, as well. I know that Ira has a, a great group working on um, issues from the U.S. Army. Um, but again, there are another dozen faculty beyond them who are participating in this program. Um, individual student achievements that we've seen. Um, this is Jadine Cobb, who was a, uh, graduated last spring. She founded her own uh, nonprofit organization, The Involvement Project, to help um, work with uh, youth and, uh, and young adults um, and bring together issues of mental health, design, and futuring um, to help um, youth and, and, and young adults with challenges. Um, Catherine Balk, you're, there you are. Um, you're not just an alum, but you're a student again. Congratulations and welcome. Um, won an ASU Changemaker uh, grant to help her test uh, what I think was her master's project in designing a, a board game for Helium Futures, bringing in co um, community voices and allowing them to think in a, um, a cross-sectoral and cross-interest way about how helium fracking in the state of Arizona might work or might not work for them. Um, and Jan Corderas Casillas um, won a fellowship from the University of Michigan. Is Jan here? Yes. Yes. Um, so you spent your summer in New York working with the National Resources Defense Council. Um, and um, this is just really a cross section of the students uh, that we have and the, the achievements that they've, uh, they've um, accomplished, that they've, awards that they've received both internally um, and externally. The, the list uh, could go on, but uh, one of the other things that I was told in the communications training, the rule of three, okay? So you saw Jadine, you saw Catherine, you saw Jan, and so now I have to go on. Okay. Um, even Johnny Carson didn't violate the rule of three. Um, so these are basically uh, the numbers of students that we have in each of our programs. I'm not going to go through it line by line or acronym by acronym, um, but you can see from the numbers that the growth rate is, shall we say, uh, not um, accelerating in any particularly robust fashion. And this is something that we have to uh, pay significant attention to. Um, basically, um, at this point, in an all-hands way, everybody in the school needs to think about how it is that we are growing our academic programs. And we have uh, this semester, um, where's Jamie? 
Um, was he was here. So, um, oh, he had to leave for class, right. So uh, Jamie Wetmore, who had been the chair of the undergraduate programs, is now the associate director for academic programs and uh, debuting a new role for the school as interim deputy director. So basically as interim deputy director in charge of a whole set of initiatives, many of which will be focused on growing the academic programs, but really providing uh, some oomph and some uh, dedication there and he will be constituting a working group uh, that uh, several of you will be involved with both at the faculty staff and uh, and student level that will focus on developing um, uh, activities that will have real resources behind them in uh, building enrollment next uh, sort of high-level headline strong progress on alumni and development infrastructure but as many of you know, the ASU has been in the midst of a large capital campaign for a couple of years, and campaign 2020 is rapidly coming to a close, and we need to put some more oomph into that as well. So some faculty from last year have seen this picture. This is me and Pat, and we're at the Chuck Box, if you recognize the background. Um, and one day last, when was it, at the end, of, Rebecca, the end of November, beginning of December? Where's, where's Rebecca? end of November, beginning of December, Pat sort of surprised us. Um, and uh, he had been in email correspondence with the foundation, with Rebecca, who is our uh, engagement and development coordinator, with me, and we'd been sending strange emails around, and Pat had found us because he was interested in innovation, and he sort of just stumbled upon ASU and the SFIS website. He had no prior connection to ASU, but he liked what he saw. He liked chatting with us. And then he called from his cell phone and said that he was in town and where could we meet? And it ended up being the Chuck Box because that's where his Uber dropped him. Um, and which was wonderful because for the you know, five people in the room who go back you know, 15 years at this institution with this group, the Chuck Box has great historic value to, um, to our work. Um, and we sat down with Pat in the Chuck Box and oh, three hours later, literally three hours later, um, we managed to sign our first planned giving agreement. Um, so Pat, with no prior connection to ASU, with an interest in innovation and the way that we approached it, that was conditioned largely through ASU's and our own still somewhat um, pale expression of it on the website, um, is essentially giving the bulk of his estate when he passes to the school for the Walter Patillo and Darby Ellers care fund. And that will you know, yield an estimated half million dollars upon its uh, realization. So that's sort of the first uh, major gift that the school has had. And it really was <laughs> um, a tribute to, uh, to Rebecca's patience in cultivating Pat because he is, as you can see in this picture, a character um, wonderfully interested in a whole set of things. Uh, for those of you in, in, in the audience who are interested in water, Pat is particularly interested uh, in water, um, but also in the perspective that ASU and the school brings to thinking about these public issues that are technologically complex. Um, we have created over the past year and a half uh, a director's circle that provides a, a fairly significant, although not huge, uh, commitment annually and that serves as a set of ambassadors for me and for the school. Uh, one of their functions is to do things like host uh, house parties and salons that help us connect with other people in the community who could um, either serve in this role or serve as connectors for the engagement and development activities that we also want to do. Um, we have an ambitious agenda for four more uh, director circle salons in the coming year and uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring as many uh, people from the faculty and some uh, select staff and students involved in those things as we go on. Um, one of the sort of, uh, sort of focuses of the development activities that we engage in and really a, a cause of momentary hyperactivity, um, which is a lot of fun and I think creates a lot of community is Sun Devil Giving Day. And do we know what the 2020 date is? Rebecca, I forgot to put that here. It's sometime in March. And it's a day when the university comes together and basically tries to develop what it will call a, a culture of philanthropy. Um, when I was an undergraduate um, and my institution, when I became an alum, my institution, its alumni association sent out a, um, 
uh, an envelope that had on the back of it uh, a cartoon by a cartoonist who was affiliated with the undergraduate institution that I went to, but I won't talk about that. Um, and the cartoon showed somebody going to their mailbox, opening up the mailbox, picking out a letter and said, the Alumni Association, I wonder what they want. Okay, now if you laugh, you're part of the culture of philanthropy because you know that the Alumni Association really only wants your money. Um, that's not what this is all about, but it is about building a culture of philanthropy that recognizes that everybody has a stake in the financial health of the university and that as a public university, as an entrepreneurial public university, as an entrepreneurial public university in a world where state legislatures are retreating from even their constitutionally obliged um, uh, um, roles in supporting uh, said universities, philanthropy is an incredibly important thing. Now, when we do Sun Devil Giving Day, everybody, you know, uh, chips in, everybody comes and helps decorate, everybody gets on social media and so on. Um, you can see the scale of resources that we generate uh, on Sun Devil Giving Day. This is for us a very good set of numbers, especially when you pitch them against other units at uh, ASU. We are sort of recognized in the ASU Foundation that coordinates development activities as one of the units that pays the serious attention, that is serious about building a culture of philanthropy, and that performs on Sun Devil Giving Day vastly beyond its peers in the other schools and colleges in terms of percentage and level of participation, and even, interestingly, in size of gift. Now, on Sun Devil Giving Day, everything above $5 counts, or $5 and above counts, um, so we do a very good job on Sun Devil Giving Day, but one of the reasons why we do a good job, I think, on Sun Devil Giving Day is this is where it goes to. Every dollar raised in Sun Devil Giving Day goes back to students through a variety of student awards and programs. So the, the charter awards that we have developed that recognize the values in, embedded in the ASU charter of access, excellence, and impact. The Future is for Everyone awards that are essentially needs-based awards to our undergraduates. Um, travel awards for students participating uh, in Solar Spell, in um, study abroad, um, some newer fellowship funds that we have with particular research centers like the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes and the Center for Science of the Imagination, a student emergency fund, um, and a, a refugee fund that importantly was used uh, a couple of years ago to help defray some of the expenses that uh, in particular graduate students whose careers in graduate school were displaced uh, by Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, that fund was available for them to help uh, some costs when they came to ASU as part of a larger ASU engagement with the University of Puerto Rico. Um, so that's where the Sun Devil Giving Day money goes to everything back to students. Um, Students, of course, become alumni. This is one of the ways, or sometimes alumni become students, Catherine. <laughs> um, this is sort of two of the ways to seeing the variety of alums that we have. On your left, um, the various formal degree programs that we have uh, currently or have had. Um, the largest of which in producing alumni, in part because it's been around for so long, in part because it has a substantial online presence, is the Global Technology and Development Program. Um, the, uh, in the light blue on the bottom, the Applied Ethics uh, and the Professions, which is a master's degree program that we inherited when the school was created. We moved a lot of people through that, but we, given the model in which that uh, master's program was built. We have not been admitting new people there, but are reconsidering what it means to do ethics training for professionals, and are, we'll be recasting that degree program. And then the um, master in science and technology policy program, which again has been around for a while, and uh, the new undergraduate program, NHSD. Um, and then you can see in the right-hand side, we also embrace a large number of people who have come through our informal programs, um, people who are not students of ours in receiving degrees, but people who will have engaged with particularly the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes in its DC manifestation and been part of the Science Outside the Laboratory program, 
for scientists and engineers at the doctoral level who have been part of the winter school that's held at the Center for Nanotechnology and Society created and now the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure sustains. And these are relatively large numbers of people every year and they're people that um, whose intellectual and career outlooks our frameworks influence and we want to um, embrace in, uh, in our community of alums. We have uh, an active alumni board that um, has now 10 members and two faculty liaisons. Uh, they run programs like alumni in residence, digital brown bags, career coffee chats. We've already had the first coffee chat this year. And it is a way of providing a continuity of experience for our undergraduates, our graduate students, and into their roles, uh, hopefully as active alums of uh, the school and being able to provide mentorship, role models, career opportunities for the students who are coming through the school. Because this, of course, is one of the challenges that we have as a school that is not related to a discipline, as a school that's not related to a profession, as a school that is related um, largely to things that are unfolding and will unfold rather than to things that have happened. Um, we have to be incredibly self-conscious about allowing students and when it comes to undergraduates in particular, their parents, to understand what career pathways might look like. And so this connection, this continuity of experience from student to alum is incredibly important for the school. Um, and then finally, we've got campaign 2020. Um, we have an assigned goal for that as well, which is uh, $20 million. We are a quarter of the way there, um, but there's not a lot of time left here. And if you look on the, the little page, a lot of the other units are, you know, um, that where, you know, where can you give? A lot of the other units are there. They've burst through their top. Many of them are, you know, not quite there, and we're all the way down here. Now, that's okay because, you know, we don't have a profession that we train people for, and when they graduate from us, they go directly into this profession earning six-figure salaries that continue to explode over time. And there are people who are in their prime earning years who are graduates of, uh, of those schools. That's not what we are. A lot of the activity that's gone on here has been on sort of the philanthropic support of research side. There was that wonderful gift that, um, that Pat Kerr made. Um, but this is where our sweet spot is, and we're developing it, and we have real opportunities over the next year, 14 months, to get a lot closer uh, to that goal. And I have um, you know, every uh, optimistic thought that we're gonna come at least very close, if not actually get there. And again, this is something, when it comes to you know, the little things, like pitching in on Sun Devil Giving Day, where it would be great that everybody could participate in this. Um, but this is also stuff that, you know, at the dollar level, as opposed to the participation and impact level, it's not about the dollars. It's about getting people involved, building a culture of the school that people want to feel part of, building a culture in the school where people feel supported, uh, where students know that if, you know, they want to go on study abroad, if uh, you know, they want to make that trip to Antarctica, which will be happening in another year or so, um, that the school is behind them and has their back financially. These are things that the school wants to do because with everybody's help, the future can be for everyone. Thank you. The one minute version of the five-year vision is a um, a faculty that continues to thrive as it has been individually and collectively, um, a student body that um, is um, certainly as, as uh, highly qualified as the current was, but is, that is drawing more energy, activity, and participation from around the university. Um, the, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that many more majors, although I would like to see the major uh, larger, but I would also like to see us involved in a variety of ways more deeply and more influentially in the set of things that go on around uh, the university. For example, um, in engineering and the engineering curriculum, um, one of the ways that we're actually uh, beginning to do that is sort of a bank shot with a new engineering school that ASU is building in conjunction with the King's College uh, London where we'll be participating in the design of some of their uh, societal content. Um, but I'd like to see 
that then composite of students and faculty be the, you know, really the go-to place for a set of actors outside in the world, recognizing the importance of this, um, this concept of technology in society. And, and Silicon Valley is beginning to get there over the past year or two, and you know at least as well as anybody in the room, that the innovators have started to at least act like they're pausing to consider the should question and not just the can question, okay? And engage with folks sometimes who are us, sometimes who look like us but are elsewhere around these kinds of questions. And so I would like that reflection to be more widespread out in the world and the school, its faculty and its students to be the fundamental connectors of that reflection. And that's probably about a minute and a quarter, but not bad. Okay. Anything else? Okay, we're done. Thank you so much. <laughs>